Aloha, everybody. This is Kathy Bilski, the Quantum Leap Let Light Unite show on UPRN Radio. And this is March 9th, 2018. And tonight I've got a special guest, um, Tara Judson Stereo. Stereo. Thank yeah. you. Um, she's a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, she wrote this incredible book called Sanity Lost and Found. Um, now, she was a bright and beautiful child brought up in an idyllic ranch setting. And as a young woman, she should have had it all. And instead, she fell prey to a psychopath who consumed more than a decade and a half of her life. And cult is a word we all know. Yep, we're going to talk about cults tonight. But few will ever have a reason to confront it in their own lives. Now, a cult is something other families might have to deal with, something that will impact other children. Maybe, maybe not. But how do we become victims of our own irrationality? What makes us vulnerable to the predators among us? How vulnerable are we? Now, following on the anniversary of the Branch Davidian cult incident, and with the sentencing of the predator, Dr. Larry Nassar, and with harsh memory of Charlie Manson, predators and cults are again in the news cycle, but it does not take a cult or a cult leader to take advantage of our vulnerabilities. And Tara not only escaped being a victim, but she went on to assist others to not be victims. Um, welcome to the show, Tara. Thank you very much. I'm, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah, what an incredible story. I mean, being in a cult and then actually getting out of it. And, you know, to me, that kind of reminds me of, you know, if you want to help someone who's an alcoholic, you have to be the alcoholic and go through it. It helps to have been there, done that in, in terms of helping people with um, this kind of form of abuse, psychological abuse and emotionally devastating someone so that they don't have a good sense of self and then we're easily controlled. That's how we become emotionally vulnerable is we don't have a good grounded sense of who we are inside. So I think we yeah. can all benefit from that. Excuse me. Oh, do you think, though, that... Um, is because of how you were raised. I think that it's a multifaceted process. There um, was a lot of distraction on the part of my parents, and so there was what we call emotional neglect. And then I endured several medical traumas and uh, was molested at the age of six and um, kind of cobbled together my life. And then when... I was in Peace Corps. It was probably the first time I had ever felt a fulfillment of what I was doing. I had these paranormal experiences that just completely, I felt like I was losing my mind. And and the experience asked me to come back to the United States and share that, that life as we knew it on the planet Earth was not going to continue unless humans changed the way that they were living. And so more things kept happening, and so I did come back, and of course you know how well that message went over, and uh, this guy was the, usually, he was really uniquely validating of this message, and I was incredibly vulnerable, very de depressed, having failed in my attempts to share this message that I felt that I needed to do. How and long old so, were you? <laughs> I was uh, 29 old enough mm -hmm. to know better, but I didn't know better. You know, I, I didn't have the skills to seek out support, maybe go to therapy. And all I kept experiencing was rejection. And I studied a bunch of modalities thinking that this was going to help me share my message. And he promised me the moon, which is what cult leaders do. They prey on your vulnerabilities and then they insidiously take away your rights and your sense of self, and pretty soon you're brainwashed and you, you're in this trance where you, you don't even know who you are anymore. What were some of the ways you were brainwashed? Well, um, he, he had a, um, has a master's degree in criminal psychology, and so um, how you break down a person is you, you find their weaknesses, you find what they're feeling guilty or ashamed about, and then you make those deeper and more significant. 
And that's what he did to all of us. You know, we all had histories that we weren't quite proud of. And so he used, you know, he confessed, asked us to confess, oh, you know, please tell me it'll help you. And so we did. We we needed to unburden ourselves of these these emotional experiences that had been. Yeah, it, kind, it, it kind of reminds, sorry, it kind of reminds me of what the priests do, especially the Jesuits back in the old days where they would get everybody to confess so they knew exactly. Exactly what every what was happening, and then they can use that against people. Yes, that is how uh, people are controlled. And um, once he knew all of these deep dark secrets, then he started insidiously using them against them and uh, against us. Jim Jones did the same thing. Just about every cult leader has these similar patterns because they break down our psyche. They break down our sense of who we are. And once our so-called rescuer becomes our perpetrator, it really is disorganizing to the mind. And what he did, what all cult leaders do, they cut you off from your social ties. And so he said, well, you know, what you've done has gotten you to this point. So doesn't it make sense to you to cut off from your past, your family, everything you've known from this point forward is new. You don't remember, you know, you can't reference anything called your past. And so It became a a mental discipline, you know, to become more mindful. And then pretty soon it became a thing that we were scorned for, having thought of a familiar person, someone that we loved, an experience that we'd had, whether it was pleasurable or negative, it was all forbidden. And so as we kept failing, he kept increasing the shame, increasing the guilt, and then the, um, the feedback was harsher and harsher, and then eventually it became abusive and and then of course we were all socially withdrawn as i say we were weren't allowed to contact the outside world our does, family does this group have a name no it was no it was um this man's particular little um version he called it the program but you know there are many different people running their own little programs all over the world but he called it the program how many people were in the group? There were six of us that I, six including myself, that I knew of. He claimed there were more, but um, there were there were six women that I know of, myself included, that were involved. Five others. Were there so any it, other it, men? Oh no! Well, actually, there was. Uh, there were two husbands of two of the women, but we never interacted with them. I mean, he was sexually involved with all of us. Is what. That's what cult leaders do. They cross your boundaries, and it's all for the service of the higher good. You know, this ideal is placed way above social norms. And if you, you know, if you, I wanted to get closer to God. So if I wanted to complete my mission to go get closer to God, I had to go along with all these other things that grew progressively more abusive. Did any of the women have children by him? One person did, yes. Wow. Um, it is a wow. <laughs> um, well, what also are some of the other methods used to take and keep control of cult victims? And, you know, were the women in your group um, your age were some very young? We were all basically the same age. I think a few were maybe a, um, maybe 10 years younger than than most of us. I think there are only two. How old was he? Uh, I think when you're younger than me, so he would be like 67 now or something. And how long ago was this that you were in the cult? This was 20 years ago that I got out in 1991. It, it took me that long to decide whether to publish this <laughs> because it, it reveals some... Um, some behaviors that when a person is in their right mind, they would go, are you kidding? Why did you put up with that? And so it took a lot to acknowledge that that I didn't know any better, therefore I didn't do any better, like Maya Angelou says, when you know better, you do better. And I was really basically brainwashed, and, and so I was supported by a therapist in writing it out, you know, journaling and pretty much describing the process and and I decided to publish it in hopes that others can recognize where their critical thinking is being compromised, where their choices are being controlled. I mean, this is, you know, a battered wife or 
uh, someone, a spouse who's a batterer is doing no less the same things that a cult leader would do. It's just a cult involves more people. A relationship is usually just two people. But they use the same techniques, and people are bonded to the perpetrator through what we call a trauma bond. Do you know what the Stockholm Syndrome is? Have you ever heard of that? I have, but can you refresh my mind? Absolutely. So there were these uh, people that were taken hostage in, I think it was in a bank, and the terrorists actually murdered one of the hostages, and they were, the, host, the terrorists, being pardon, were finally apprehended, but as the authorities were taking them away, the hostages were very cautious and very like, oh, don't hurt them, don't hurt them. And so they had bonded with their perpetrators, and that's what human beings do. It's a survival technique. It's not coming from the smartest part of our brain, but it's coming from a survival place in our brain, and it's very, a very primitive defense, but that's what happens to human beings when we're held hostage, and we feel trapped, and we feel like, you know, the end is near, we we will make a last-ditch at- attempt to survive, it's called a trauma bond. Was, so all wasn't that, that, if I can add, what, you remember um, Patty Hearst? Patty Hearst, yeah, exactly the same thing happened to her. She became a bank robber. I mean, they raped her, they put her in the closet, they deprived her. She was her. kidnapped, though. She was yes, kidnapped? Yes, she was kidnapped, right. But they broke her down psychologically. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, I mean, all of us were convinced that we were going to help the world become a better place. All of us, this was during a time, this was in the late 70s, during the 80s was for the most part when I was with him. And people were involved in all kinds of movements to, quote, transform the world. I mean, there were the Hare Krishnas, Rajneesh people at the airport and um, the Moonies came about. Then there were all kinds of consciousness raising movements as I had been very involved with S and it was just something that was happening in our culture and it was um, in other areas of the world too. I knew someone in Peace Corps who disappeared with the children of the God movement, children of God movement, excuse me. So, so there was something happening in the cultures at that time in maybe, if you will, mass consciousness where people wanted to, raise their consciousness and help the planet. And um, the Rajneesh movement, the Moody's movement, they were all extremely abusive, as was what we got involved in. Yeah, in good times, huh? Yeah. Good times. <laughs> well, at least we didn't have to drink the Kool-Aid, right? So, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank gosh. Thank goodness. Yes, yes I'm <clears throat> very grateful for that. Well... You know, it sounded like y'all went through a lot of trauma. We did. Yeah, we really did. Um, now, was it more emotional trauma? Or, again, you know, you did mention being physically abused. Yeah, all of us were physically abused. Um, most of us ended up with broken teeth. or three of us who have permanent hearing damage. Um, oh, my broke- God. Yeah, he broke my nose. I mean, you know, um, various and sundry things. And it was all, you know, since then I've learned that God is a God of love. But, you know, we were told that we were being punished for our past sins, you know, our karma or whatever. The reason was, pardon me, you know, that we were sort of being destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah, that type of thinking. And and we bought into it. I mean, you know, we were... Well, you were manipulated. You oh, yeah, were manipulated. Totally. Yeah. And yeah, I would absolutely. bet this man knew how to work with energy because he would oh, put yeah. energy overlays where you couldn't break free. And that's, yeah. you know, you mentioned the battered woman. And, yeah. you know, the guy batters her and everybody can see it but her because he's got such a strong overlay over her. Oh, so yeah. not I mean, only did he manipulate you through mentally, but, you know, on a physical level. Yes. Yeah, no, it's definitely an energetic overlay because, you know, people retreat from the present moment, just like a turtle withdraws into its shell. And and it would become like in a trance. And so that overlay is like the fog, the mental, emotional fog that's around us. It's, you know, in psychological terms, it's called dissociation. And um, that that was encouraged 
then whenever we started to come back to ourselves, we were battered to send us back into that fog, that mental fog. And that's the energy overlay that you're referring to. It's very real. Uh Um, So how in the world did you manage and what got you to actually leave? Well, as I write in the book, several times I escaped because I kept thinking if I'm serving God, I'm trying to do the highest work, right, to become more spiritual. It shouldn't be so painful. I shouldn't have all of my needs and rights disrespected. And so um, so I tried to leave several times, and um, I, I uh, would keep getting pulled back because for various number of reasons. But in that process, I would check in with familiars. Like one time I escaped to my mother's, I escaped to my grandmother's a couple of times. And I had people from my former life, you know, before I met him, tell me that, you know, I could serve God, but their God was a God of love. I didn't have to go through this. And, and actually some strangers that we met relayed the same message. And it started to sink in. It was like a little piece of the puzzle was put back inside of me and another piece and another piece. And people's kindness and compassion instead of, you know, judgment and rejection, that's what had gotten me into that situation in the first place. Their kindness and the relationships that were offered to me were what helped me get back in touch with myself and um, and, and so then I just had to prove that, quote, my mission was over and so I asked for this miracle that if I had six pennies that turned up heads then I was done and um, at one particular point I tossed them up in the air and they all came up heads and I knew because a couple of other of the conditions had met he had run out of money he had tons of people giving him lots and lots of money but his support system had dried up and he always said that my work would be done when his financial support was eroded and sure enough we didn't have any money and I had my sign so I felt that I had completed whatever it was that I needed to do and I was able to emancipate myself and then I was a very broken individual and my family my friends uh and I went into therapy for the first time in my life helped me reconstitute myself you know put myself back together again once you and when you left him the last time, did he try to keep coming after you? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, in badgering me with, you haven't completed your mission. What about this? What about that? And, um, you know, it was did very you, clear. Excuse me, go ahead. Oh, I'm, did you get a restraining order? No. <laughs> no. No, but I um, learned how to find my voice and learned about my rights and, and learned how and this all in the book, you know, how I told him that he was the last person on earth that I would want to have dinner with and la, la, la. So <laughs> we had anything else with. Um, <laughs> so now you've actually turned this really tragic event and, you know, some really harsh lessons into a positive. And how did you decide to become a therapist? Well, I actually had the first time I'd ever been in therapy, I was... Uh, It was in bioenergetic therapy, which is a mind-body form of discipline. I mean, instead of just talking about it, you actually feel and try to work through the trauma in your body. And I was breathing and asking God why. And I just started sobbing because of just what I had gone through. And I asked that a lot. But this time I heard in my head, go back to school, get a job, you know, study psychology, and that was essentially the answer why. In other words, get a life, but study psychology, and that wasn't told, but I, it was inferred, and you'll figure it out, you know, and and it really helped. It it, um, it filled in a lot of the blanks. It's it's called emotional intelligence. Intellectual, you know, intellectual quotient has really nothing to do with your emotional level of maturity, And when you don't get those emotional needs met when you're growing up or when you've suffered trauma, like, you know, you have post-traumatic stress disorder, it it dishevels the brain. And it's very difficult to be grounded, to make rational decisions because our fear will hijack us or our anger. I was kind of rageful for a while and I wrote about that. 
because I wanted people to know that there are ways other than being an idiot on the freeway to work through your rage, but it, it took me learning by experience. You know, I, I got a ticket and I realized that I had an anger issue. <laughs> and um, when it, you know, <laughs> went into deep therapy. So um, it, it's pretty predictable if we study human behavior. We're pretty predictable people. I mean, um, we have certain needs. When those needs aren't met, we are less than an optimum self. We're not very social. We're kind of like dog eat dog. And so I started recognizing that this was kind of predictable for me and it made it much easier to forgive myself because I think that's very important that we that we not harbor grudges and not hate, but really try to understand one another. So you've actually so, forgiven this man? Yes, yes. And myself. That was the hardest to forgive myself. Oh, you know, I just... I, I really realized that I had hated myself all along. The traumas had remained within me unresolved, and um, the emotions that I had around it I identified as being who I was, and I hated the things that had happened to me. And the hatred really ended up being mirrored to me through his behavior. You know, I do understand, because I've been around a master manipulator myself. Uh -huh. And, you know, they try to put everything on you. Yeah. And, you know, they do no wrong, but it's always you doing oh, yeah. it. And um, if you catch them in a lie or doing something wrong, it's like, well, what were you doing there to begin with? You know, exactly. I mean, I'm, on you. oh, yeah. yeah, they just spin it around. Right. Um, wow. You know, um, so let's let's just what are some of the signs um, the person you're letting into your life is a potential abuser? Well, that's a really good question, Kathy. Um, first of all, when your choices are restricted, where you find you're making really impulsive changes, um, your, you know, your choices and your freedom uh, are both being restricted. When you feel like you're being controlled, those are signs that someone is moving in to take you over. You feel smothered, maybe don't have um, any time or space apart from them. You know, like if someone's Velcroed to you and then they have a lot of criticism for you in, in a controlling way, <coughs> excuse me, if they don't validate your choices, those are signs that you're being set up to be abused. And it just, you know, if it's really important that we know our rights and that we articulate our displeasure with someone when they're steamrolling over our boundaries. Boundaries are very important. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Um, all right. So what are some of the signs that you are emotionally vulnerable? Um, when this is where this person is not really clear about him or herself, so they rarely state their preferences, and they usually concede to choices of others, like someone who says, you know, where do you want to eat? Oh, I don't know. And, well, come on, you know, it's your turn to choose. Well, I don't really know. That's There's an emotional vulnerability in, in that inability to say, well, I want to eat hot dogs tonight, or I want to go to a vegetarian restaurant. You know, it, you know we you all mean, have preferences. You mean it's just not being a Gemini and not being able to make a decision? <laughs> Even Gemini's have have polar extremes, right? You know, I mean, like like hot dogs one night, vegetarian the next, right? Organic, let's go organic. <laughs> but yeah, um, no, it's not just being a Gemini. But that was a good one. Um, they, um, you, you're you're emotionally vulnerable. For instance, if someone can talk you into something, or you know, into experience something, buying something that you really didn't want to do, you know, like say someone says, "Let's go bungee jumping." And I use this as an example because I'll never bungee jump. I, mean, I think life is very precious to me right now since I pretty much let someone try to destroy it and myself too. So, and you, no, I don't really want to. Oh, come on, it'll be fun. And eventually you end up bungee jumping, you know, terrified. And that's, you know, that's someone has played or preyed upon your emotional vulnerability. So um, if you're impulsive, that's not real good. You know, you, we need to pause 
and really f- reflect before we do things. Unless, you know, you're on the railroad tracks and the train's coming. That's that's a good time to be impulsive to get off. Um, <laughs> but another, uh, more signs about being emotionally vulnerable, you're not able to contain or think through your emotions. And that comes with emotional impulsivity. You know, it's really difficult sometimes to people, for people, excuse me, to feel the anxiety of not knowing. Well, that's okay because that's an opportunity for the mystery to inform us and, and for us to grow a little bit in being able to tolerate frustration, being able to tolerate not knowing, and to learn patience. It's, it's uh, a virtue, really. And sometimes we forget that as we drum our fingers in front of the microwave, right? So um, you think your worth is dependent on your income, your beauty, you know, social status, present on, presence on social media, where your your sense of self is validated by what's external to you instead of what's internal to you. In, in other words, people who have peace of mind or a sense of well-being, that comes from within us. And when we're mindful of the brain and all of its emotional flip-flopping, but we have this steadiness about us, and when we're impulsive and, you know, someone makes a negative comment about our hair and, you know, the world is ending, that's, you know, someone who's very vulnerable. And, of course, when we're young, we're incredibly vulnerable. Yeah, then they just push the kids onto drugs. Yeah, I mean, the the reason for that or any kind of distracting behavior, video games are big now, social media is big, we can, we can lose copious amounts of time with the Internet or with... The, our electronics and the reason for that is it's a dissociative place or the trans place is the turtle which drawing in its shell it's that place where we numb out we don't feel the pain of not belonging we we don't feel the pain of our emotional vulnerability or that we don't really have many friends and and it's like a drug because it keeps us numb to reality because the fear is so great we don't feel we can move through it and it really takes the support of another. Come on, let's go out, get in the sun, walk around, you know, you know, shoving your kids outside to play, not shoving them out, I mean, inviting them to go out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't watch what I say. I'm just, anyway. Uh, <laughs> We've all been that. there. Yeah, it's <laughs> really okay from one mother to another. We've been there. Um, and we've yeah, you don't want to lock them outside, so... <laughs> Um, no, but sometimes you do push them out the door and go, yes. you know, you're, go play. You're, yeah. Yeah. Go and then play. pretty soon, and then pretty soon they find that they're having fun and you see they're alive in their bodies. Their bodies are growing and developing their, their intellect is being stimulated. We grow through play. We connect through play, through pleasure. You know, people gather around food, pleasure and fire, you know, we, we're social creatures. And so if, you know, someone's gaming, they're setting themselves up to be incredibly emotionally vulnerable, but that's also um, just kind of a, a better than substance abuse, but it's along that same rabbit hole. They're, they're setting themselves up for being socially disengaged. Well, it is, and, and yeah, I'm sorry, I've got boys, and at one time um, when they were in their teens, they played um, Halo, and that's a military game. And it affected my one son. I had to take it away from him because it's like you're you're fighting, you're in war. You know, his yeah, testosterone yeah. got up and he started attacking his sister and oh, really dear. being obstinate, you know, like, right. Rrr. and I right. was like, this, this doesn't work for me. And we had so many fights over it. But I can see how it can change you. Yeah. And um what well, what are some of the signs that your child is emotionally vulnerable uh, they're socially withdrawn they lack healthy friends they have poor school performance they're maybe afraid to try new things you know they're really hesitant to, co- to go outside of their comfort zone at the at the frontier of every new thing the growth edge that we're approaching will be fear because the brain fears what's what's different or unusual. That's a survival mechanism. You know, the, the, our ancients that, you know, thought that the fuzzy rock was safe, you know, they didn't pass on their DNA. But the, the automatic reaction to difference is where prejudice comes from. This is where judgments come from. You know, it's, it's really important that we 
not stay locked into that more primitive part of the brain, but we are socially engaged. But if you see someone who's not or who's pulling back, not having healthy friends, that's that's a sign that they're emotionally vulnerable. When children have to have everything perfect, that shows that they're really afraid to fail because it's afraid it's a, a, fa- a fear, beg your pardon, of being rejected. You know, if it's not perfect, then I won't be loved. It won't be good enough because the, their bottom line relationship with themselves is I'm not good enough. And so if I'm perfect or for for instance, in my deal, I always try to save the world, then I'll be loved. So, um, and then they have exaggerated fears of failing, and that goes along with the need to be perfect. If, you know, if a if, if child is exhibiting those signs, they need support. They need more support than maybe an, another child who doesn't suffer from those things. You know, social isolation decompensates us, and that's another way of we mentally and socially deteriorate. You know, there's nobody more isolated than the homeless. And, you know, they're not very socialized and they're very isolated. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a window that closes with human beings that they're not able to be rehabilitated. So children have uh, tremendous what we call neuroplasticity. All it takes is for someone to show up and care for them, be interested in them, validate them, honor their feelings, take an interest in them. Spend face-to-face time, not sitting, you know, next to one another watching TV, but eyeball to eyeball, go out and play catch with them, you know, in that in-between time, driving them home from school, hey, how was it, you know, what's going on, get to know their friends, you know, that's a way of insulating or inoculating your kids from becoming emotionally vulnerable and from becoming uh, bullied, from being bullied, excuse me. Now, for adults, would you say that it's really be a good idea to ju- to join um, a support group? Um, well, we all need support. Um, if people have been violated, yes, that would they could greatly benefit from a support group. You know, like there there are all kinds of they call them survivor groups or self help groups, and um, that that they are usually self-run and self-led and what's based on a social model. So, you know, people who've been through whatever trauma they're wanting to heal from help the the new ones coming in. You know, like AA is really famous, uh, codependence is. So if you've suffered a trauma or you feel isolated, it would be very important to find a group or at least another, not to remain isolated, but to find someone with whom you can share and and receive support. And, of course, we hope that our families can do that, and we hope that our partners can do that, but sometimes it takes a little bit more. You know, it takes a village to raise a child. It really takes a village to maintain a healthy community. You know, we need to come together. To I agree. Now, you... Um you're a therapist, and yes. you really help others find peace, harmony, and fulfillment well, I, I in their lives. So. Okay, I, I hope so. I'm I'm not perfect, and you know I fail to do that as well. So it's it's my intention to do that. <laughs> um, oh, somebody's got to do it, darn it. Um, is Are there me? like is there a technique that you give people to center themselves or actually find that peace? you know, some kind of breathing, or what do you recommend that they do? Well, um, research has shown that people who bounce back from trauma, we call that resilience, have support, they have a grounded connection, they reintegrate into their bodies, and they learn how to manage their emotions, and they have interpersonal support that offers them empathy and compassion. And so that's ideally what therapy needs to do. And our breathing regulates our emotions. You know, when when we have little sippy breaths, we send danger, danger, warning, warning signals to the brain. And so that's what generates panic and panic attacks. And, um, you know, the old expression, whistle if you're afraid, it's to get you to start breathing. And uh, people who are depressed typically have very shallow breathing as well. So, so breath is in and of itself self-regulating. One of the reasons that people feel better after exercise is because they've engaged in deep breathing. Singing does the same thing. 
and and the body needs to move. You know, bodies were designed to move, and the more still you are, the more you know. The ultimate stillness is death, and so so the mind body techniques that I use are to get people to breathe, to become aware of their emotions. Um, Dan Siegel, a famous interpersonal neurobiologist, calls it. He's a psychiatrist, and he says, "Name it, tame it," and I add feel it, heal it. And so it's a matter of our attention is what heals. I mean, if you've had children, you know that if they skinned their knee or, you know, some mishap occurred that isn't like a life-threatening or, you know, a hospital visit, they would run to you, mommy, mommy, you know, and all you needed to do is pay attention to them, kiss it, and boom, they're back out there playing again because it's the attention that heals. The attention from another, our own attention. And so... So, you know, we call that mindfulness now, but it's attention to the body. The body needs breath, body needs movement, and the body needs comfort. We need connection. We're social creatures. You know, um, we we need to be touched. We, you know, we need to know that we belong. So those are the things that that I like to establish with people, and it can make a profound difference in a person's life. And, of course, just being heard a burden shared is half the burden, and that's one of the benefits of psychotherapy is that you get to tell your stuff, and it's not going to get broadcast around the community. No one's going to make fun of you, and it's really you leave it there, and you try to find better ways. A person tries to find better ways to live their life. It's, it's kind of like the village listener, you know, <laughs> the shaman or, you know, whomever was the, the wise person that's what psychotherapy can become. Well, that's what I was just going to toss out at you, and funny you brought up shaman, that you've also experienced a lot of mysticism in your life. And yes. how does that, um, how do you integrate that in your therapy? Well, um, legally I cannot do that to be a licensed marriage and family therapist, but what I like to do is use the, connection that I think we all have with our essence. I mean, Einstein said that that the you know, he called it the unified field where we're all connected. And I think he was a very wise man. And most people are recognizing that there's this spark that leaves when the body dies. And, and I, you know, I call that the essence, the soul, whatever, you know, the, the spark of God, whatever you want to call it. But to get people in touch with that is, I think is very powerful. So that was, um, what I was being facilitated in getting in touch with, and it was kind of molding me in uh, a direction that, you know, this is where I am. I'm not done yet. I hope to continue growing. But I, you know, I don't do readings anymore. I don't do any of that kind of stuff just because what I found in in traveling around with this guy, we were like spiritual vagabonds. We were doing readings for people and trying to help. And <laughs> no matter how many times you told someone that they're, essence was beautiful, you know, because they were made an image of God or whatever that was, it didn't go through because of the emotional overlay, because of the wounds and the trauma and the misperceptions of self that the ego defenses that are in the brain had developed. And, and um, I mean, it worked for, it, it, the same applied to me. I, I didn't know I deserved better. And so I felt like being a, a therapist to help Remove, remove that armoring to help remove or transform those uh, self-perceptions that were skewed would be the most powerful way of getting people in touch with their essence. So what do you hope readers will take from your book? I hope they will learn about themselves and they will learn more about humanity, that they will be curious about their purpose and hopefully they will develop more empathy for the less privileged and the dysfunctional and most of all I hope it's a journey of re reading one woman's wacky journey to self and maybe they can learn something from it to apply to their lives I mean very um, vulnerable in that process and I think that like Brene Brown says that vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation creativity and well-being well they're two kinds of vulnerability, and I hope that they recognize that there's 
of vulnerability where you get set up for shame and annihilation or, you know, emotional annihilation. And there's vulnerability where we listen, we're not jammed with the yada yada, but we take in nature, we take in a pause to to appreciate what we have, that, that we feel our connection. So that's what I'm hoping will happen. That's pretty grandiose, but I I wrote it with the idea to serve. So the book's called Sanity, Lost and Found, and where can they get the book? Uh, it's on Amazon, or you can just ask for it in any major bookstore. How easy is that? And can they also get a hold of you um, to do any counseling? Uh, I would not do any counseling over the phone. I'm um, going to have a website with blogs. I'm hoping that helps. I'm um, I'm not. I'm a firm believer in face-to-face contact is really what we need, or you know, voice-to-voice. But if people are interested, you know, they can access my website, which is being launched in about two weeks. It's called SanityLostAndFound.com. And I have an email address, again, sanitylostandfound at cox.net. But I, I'm um, really not wanting to engage in online or uh, phone counseling. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that that people will find others locally where they are because you really need to have an ongoing connection. If you know, If we're going to heal, we need to have someone consistently supporting us not just a phone call. I mean, phone calls are nice, but if you know the person, so um, that's are you it. In, I, I, are you in California? Yes, yes. Okay, well, we narrowed the state down, people. Okay. <laughs> 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 well, thank you, oh, Tara. I've really enjoyed having you on. And um, Thank you, Kathy. It's been an honor, truly. Thank you. I, I know it's a hard subject to talk about, and... Um, you know, I'm sorry for your experiences, but thank you for writing this great book. Well, thank you. And actually, anymore, I'm I'm not sorry. I, I'm actually grateful. I, I uh, quote Nietzsche in the book that your greatest, your worst enemies are your greatest teachers. And I've I've come to believe that if we work at this stuff long enough, there is there is a light at the end of the tunnel. It's not always easy, and and certainly not not about anything being fair. But I think that that is available to us. <laughs> so, yeah, so. and earn the grace. Yes, we do. I think we do earn the grace. It's it's uh, you know it's not about an eye for an eye. It's it's really about compassion and empathy. You know, and forgiveness. Those are human yes. traits. Oh my God. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you again, and you. your book yes. is called Sanity Lost and Found. Yes, a true story of brainwashing and recovery. It's a long time. So, <laughs> yeah. Everybody, thank you very much, and I hope you have a wonderful week, and um, God sends you a heart's desire. Yes. And on that note, aloha.